Hello, I'm Cam. Join me as we read 1 Kings 19, 9 to 18. There he went to into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. The voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu son of Nimshai king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel-Mahola to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet, I will, I will reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. <clears throat> Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Cam, for reading our scripture for us today. <clears throat> Well, welcome here, everyone, this morning, and welcome to those online. I'm glad that you have joined us, and I hope you'll be encouraged by the Word of God. In Matthew 4.4, 4, oh, my name is Rusha, by the way. I'm the women's pastor here. If we've not met, I hope to meet and engage with you sometime and have a good conversation. In Matthew 4.4, 4, it says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I believe the word of God is alive, powerful, and is described in numerous places in the Bible as food for God's people. These spiritual words impart nourishment for our souls and encouragement for our spirits. I pray that will be true for you today as we study 1 Kings 19, 10 to 18. Let me just pray for us. Lord God, I thank you that we can open up your word together, that we can hear from you, that we can see a life story, a journey played out where you encounter one of your prophets, where you speak. Lord, we thank you and we pray that we would have open hearts to hear, that you would uh, show us what we need to take from today and that you would meet us here. Thank you, Lord God, that you love us so much and your love has just flown through, um, been through the worship and, and just been on top of us through the songs that we've sung and it's here in this room and we just want to receive it and say thank you, Lord. Thank you for being in our presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to go back a little bit in the story as we walk through to where we are today in um, 1 Kings 19. Elijah is a leader in Israel and God's prophet. His life journey was full of courage, faith, and trust in God. And he displayed a strength of character. He was a man who challenged godless king, a godless king regarding his disobedience and the God he served. Elijah is a man that believed and trusted in the power of God. Last week we heard that after a conquering and revealing of God's power, the personal threat on Elijah's life from Jezebel affected him greatly. And it was the beginning of his personal decline. He was afraid. He was running for his life. He was alone and isolated and desperate. He cried out to the Lord in chapter 19, verse 4, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. When I was studying for this, I read through many commentaries, and it was noted there that Moses, a leader, Jeremiah, a major prophet, and Jonah, a minor prophet, all felt the same at various times in their roles. 
Elijah was not alone in his experience as a leader and as a man following after God, but he was still discouraged, even though he had an, had an incredible encounter with the living God. Fear had robbed him. We are all affected by fear. We've all been afraid at some point, some even to the point of being immobilized or paralyzed. I wonder if I were having a cup of tea with each of you, and I asked you, how do you battle against fear? What would you say? How do you battle against fear spiritually, emotionally, mentally? Proverbs 19.25 says, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. The opposite of fear is faith. I have walked with a teenage girl that moved into her home when she was 16, who was very afraid of death and dying and had an aged grandmother that was ill. It consumed her thoughts and robbed her of her peace. And when she began to understand that Jesus loved her, gave his life for her and for all mankind, and that when this earthly life was over, there was a heavenly home for her. When that all became clear to her and she understood it, and she made a decision to follow Jesus and give his li her life to, to Jesus, something happened inside of her. That fear that she had was removed and replaced with peace and joy. Now, I know in this room there are many women and men, many young people, that have had incredible encounters with God. You've seen miracles. You've seen God's provision. You have testimonies of faith. And these encounters and divine moments that inspire and encourage us. And I think it's so incredibly wonderful if we can retell those stories so we can be reminded of the power of God in our lives. I wonder if I could hear your stories of faith. Would you say anything has robbed you of the full impact and encounter of God? Oh, Elijah and fear was robbed of the impact of his previous powerful encounters with God. With despair and delusionment, he moved on. But an angel ministered to him two times with two times of provision. Get up and eat. God's provision, compassion, care demonstrated he was near. What a great God we serve. Ministering to the prophet in his time of exhaustion and burnout. Understanding and care. Yes, it's been too much, Elijah. Rest, replenish. Rest, replenish. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached the mountain of God, Horeb, or better known as Mount Sinai. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. Moses had, Moses had also been in this, in this place, Mount Sinai, when God gave him the Ten Commandments. Why did Elijah run there? Was he seeking God to be with him in his place of internal struggles? When you find yourself in terms of difficulty and in times of discouragement, do you run to God or do you run from him? Sometimes running from him denies that you actually have a burden or a need or refusing to fully surrender to God when he's already spoken to you. I want to encourage you, seek him out. And maybe for some of you, you haven't been able to run, but you've been able to find someone who would help you find your way to God. If someone ran to you today, Somebody in the street, somebody at the grocery store, somebody in your family, somebody that you don't know well came to you in discouragement. Would you be able to lead them in prayer and conversation to our great and amazing God? Let's expand on verses 9 to 18. We find Elijah in a cave on a mountain, and the Lord speaks to Elijah. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? A simple question. I don't believe it was harsh or condemning, or scolding, but more in the tone of, tell me, Elijah, what has brought you to this place? A question that provided a chance for Elijah to personally assess his, his own situation, to reflect and to acknowledge his answer to the living God. We have seen this before in Scripture, too. In the garden when God asked Adam, where are you? In Genesis 3, 9. He knew where Adam was, but he wanted to hear Adam's response. What about Mark 10, 51 and 52? Jesus is speaking to a blind man, and he says, Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? Teacher, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. God knows everything. 
God sees everything, and yet he wants to hear our hearts in response to his words. God's interest in Elijah's heart and the way he's choosing to reveal himself to him is so encouraging to me. I hope it's encouraging to you too. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah, he says. And then he listens to his response. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. Elijah described himself, if you note it there, a very zealous person for the Lord. I am very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. What does zealous mean? What does it look like? It comes from the Greek word zealous or zealous. I'm not sure really how to say it. To be zealous means to be, have a passion, enthusiasm, a fervor of spirit. As a zealous believer, one is eager to embrace, pursue, and defend Jesus in everything they do. I, I think we can say, yes, that was Elijah's past story. It revealed this passionate faith and embrace for the Lord. He truly is zealous for the Lord. Would you describe yourself that way? Would you say, I am zealous for the Lord God Almighty? Would other people describe you that way? What does it even look like in this world? Does it mean we know God and we step out to pray for a friend, to speak truth when we know it needs to be spoken? In love, by the way, <laughs> always truth in love. Does it mean going and serving when God says, come, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm wanting you, I'm telling you, please go here to this situation, to this person, because we're compelled by God's love. I guess the question for all of us is what is stopping us from embracing, pursuing, and defending Jesus in everything we do. Elijah's disappointment, his isolation, his fear colored his vision. He could only see what had happened to his people and not the results of the victory of war where there were 450 prophets of Baal who were defeated. Was he feeling like he'd failed God? So discouraged, so much despair, so disillusioned. But the Israelites are not zealous for the Lord, he said. Elijah had witnessed so many things that didn't honor God. He was obedient and determined and directed by God to make a difference and see repentance. And yet, the results were not as he had hoped. In my experience, when one serves God and experiences miracles or victories and moments of incredible transformation, it's often followed by times of vulnerability. Elijah had poured himself out for the Lord, and now he stood vulnerably before his God. And how does the Lord respond to him in verse 11? He speaks to him. He directs him. He tells him what he is about to do. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. The power of the Lord is displayed in front of Elijah. The power of the Lord has been displayed like this before in Exodus 19 with Moses. When there was the thunder and the shaking of the mountain, when, there, when um, God spoke to Moses in that same place, God has displayed this power and majesty in encounters before. So he says to him, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Elijah was now witnessing the things Moses had seen and what he himself had seen in Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. Elijah knew and had seen the power of God before. He had witnessed the miracles of God. He knew his power could change landscapes and change lives. He believed God was able and was alive. As a discouraged follower of God, perhaps he needed a fresh encounter the Lord knew what he needed, and he met him. For after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. 
the gentle whisper. What did God say to Elijah in that gentle whisper? Not the wind, not the earthquake, not the fire, but the gentle whisper was how God revealed himself to Elijah in this space of his own discouragement. Maybe it was Elijah's heart was wrestling with many things that had needed an encounter with the living God. The gentle whisper, to me that's so profound, so beautiful of our God, how close he wants to come to us and to communicate to us. He was heard by Elijah as is demonstrated by Elijah's movement outside the cave, covering his face in honor and respect of this holy God. God beckoned him out of isolation. The gentle whisper, God speaks. Are you listening? The Lord asked him a second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 10 and 14 are the exact same response verbally. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and you put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. We don't know how that was said. We see the words. I wonder if the tone was different. I wonder how he responded there. Because he'd already been listened to, spoken to. He'd had rest. He'd been mentored to, mentored and ministered to. He'd been seen. And God was meeting him in his time of despair. In every season of our lives, the Lord wants to meet you. The Lord is near Call on him. In my ministry here as a women's pastor, I have sometimes been the holder of hope for those who can't find it when they come broken, discouraged, in despair. And I've said, I know where to find it for you. I know where to go. You can't right now? It's okay. I will be the holder of hope for you. I have been the bearer of burdens when people have poured out their journey to me, and I have carried those burdens very carefully, but very confidently into the arms of my Heavenly Father, as he's the only one that can actually minister and do all the individual needs. I've been the intercessor, the prayer warrior, fighting against the enemy's attacks for people's souls, people's minds, people's freedom, Sometimes the Lord doesn't let me sleep and he doesn't let me rest because he says, this person, this one, that stranger who you saw, intercede for me. Thank you, Lord. I have asked the Lord to show me and help me to continue to show mercy, grace, and love because I want the world to know this incredible, powerful God we serve. And sometimes I have had the privilege of opening the gate to the kingdom of God for a person discovering God's truth for the very first time. Praise God. That is such a beautiful thing. Thank you, Lord. I want to ask you, are you like Elijah? Do you long for the ministry of God in your life? What does God do next? He restores his vision for the future for what the future will hold. He reveals his detailed plan and his journey from this place. If we look now where it says, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. He gives him direct, direct place to go to. And when you get there, he tells him what he wants him to do. He gives him three assignments. I, I may not be saying these names correctly, so bear with me. Anoint Hazel king over Aram. Anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu, or Jehu will put to death anyone who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. God would use three men, these three men, to complete the purge of Baal worship that Elijah had begun. Elijah had good works to do that the Lord had designed for him to do still. The Lord had chosen Elisha to succeed him as prophet. 
So now he would mentor Elisha and they would walk together for many years. How beautiful is that? How wonderful for Elijah to be restored into kingdom work after a time of discouragement. The Lord is the giver of hope. He's the giver of vision. He's the one who calls and equips those who follow him. And in verse 18, Elijah needed to be reminded, like we do, you are not alone. God sees the larger picture. He knows the, the hearts and the actions of man. And he encourages him. He says, Yet I, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. These words must have been so encouraging to Elijah, who had expressed the feeling of his heart prior, feeling so alone as a zealous follower of the Lord. I don't know what you think his response is, but I think he probably put his hands in the air and said, Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. There are more followers of you, God. Hallelujah. Each week across this world, people meet. The church meets. Those who know, love, and follow God. You're not alone in this faith journey. You're not alone. As the Spirit lays names, countries, people on your heart, lift them up in prayer. And let's um, stand together in this journey, reminding one another that we are following an amazing, powerful God. Can you relate to anything in Elijah's story? God pursues. God speaks. God listens. God restores. And God directs our journey. Reminds me of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Elijah's path took a little detour to a cave where God met him and put him back on the path of where he wanted him to be. That moment in the cave was divine, on a divine appointment with Elijah and his powerful God, restoring him after discouragement and fatigue. I have studied the portion of Elijah's story. I've been so thankful for our great, great God. And I can identify with many of the scenes in Elijah's faith journey, and I just want to share them with you. I've been so moved by gratitude for our great God. I long to hear God's voice more. You see, sometimes God speaks to us in a, with force, and he reveals his mighty power. And sometimes God speaks in a whisper, and he reveals his mighty power. I want to be constantly aware of his nudge, his word, his correction, spoken through you, my church family, spoken through my, my own personal family, through my brothers and sisters in Jesus, wherever I go. While I daily meet with him, I want to hear from him. And when he intersects my day with encouragement, which he often does, and many of you in this church building have been encouragements to me over the years. Thank you. I want to serve God with a zealous, passionate heart all the days of my life. Do you want that too? I hope you do. I hope we can do that together. So whether you're under five, like the kids hiding their truth in hearts at Revive Kids where I serve on Wednesday mornings, and they'll say, teacher, teacher, the birds, the birds upon the treetop, and they want to sing, the birds upon the treetop sing their song. The angels chant their chorus all day long. Yeah, hiding those truths. Or they say, joy, joy. I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. So whether you're starting off as a little one or you're 99 years old, like my friend who I just spoke to recently, and she shared this with me. I don't know why God hasn't taken me to heaven yet. It must mean he still has something he wants me to do. And she said, and so I will do it. I can pray. Or what about all my volunteer leaders who figured out where they're spiritually gifted and they're passionate and they serve with such incredible love and commitment. They want to show the Lord to whomever enters our church doors. 
whether it's Women Center Drop-In, Mommy and Me, Moms and Tots, The Living Room, I could go on and on, English conversation classes. The world comes through these doors each week. What a blessing to be zealous for the Lord and share his love with them. I've learned for myself to be zealous for the Lord. I need community. I need community to bring me hope when I sometimes have none, or truth when I've forgotten, or vision when I just can't see. And this means I also need to know who I am. I'm a child of God. 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Now, we are in community right here, right now. And so we don't want to miss this opportunity. So I'm going to ask you to do something for me. I want you to turn around, turn to the left, turn to the right, turn somewhere and see someone. And I want you to say, I'm really glad you came here today. May the Lord lavish his love upon you. All right, go. Years ago, I spoke at a women's event. I spoke at a women's event in a different church. And as the women gathered into the room, I just took kind of a, I don't know, a feel for the room. And I was like, hey, how many of you got a hug this morning? A couple hands went up. How many of you got a hug last week? Same hands went up. How many of you got a hug last month? And I looked around the room and I realized we were going to have a hugging ministry in that room. And I realized that connection is something lots of us are lacking. Many people can feel unseen, unnoticed. Many people don't get a touch on the shoulder, although you should ask somebody if it's okay first, if you touch people. But I want to challenge you. As a family of God compelled by his love, let's be an incredibly strong, great community with one another. I have served God in many ways and in many places, and I still have breath. And I still have a microphone, thank you. And I will still proclaim his name until I die. I want to be a zealous follower. I want to live in community. I also understand the feeling of vulnerability after a faith event or a missions trip or a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one conversation. You see, when I reflect after that, all I longed for was for God to be glorified and known. And sometimes in my evaluation and my reflection, I felt it could have been more effective. Or I needed more time. Or I wasn't equipped for the cultural needs or the situation at hand. Or I looked around the room and there were people missing in the room. People I'd prayed for that just, they weren't there. Or... I don't know what the Lord did in that time, and I don't know if everybody responded to the Holy Spirit's call. But I've had to learn that I have to leave those results to my great God, to have faith and trust in Him. The day of our women's retreat last April, I expressed to my husband on the Friday morning before it started, Honey, we need to stop and pray. And he's like, why? I said, the women are phoning me. And he's like, what's happening? I'm like, they're not coming. They're canceling. He's like, oh, dear, how many people are registered? I said, 80. Oh, how many are, are canceling? Like 10, 15, 20? I said, no, three. Three. And he said, three? Well, don't be discouraged by that. Sickness happens. Things happen. Then he looked at me and he said, wait a minute. You'd be discouraged if one couldn't make it, wouldn't you? And I said, yes, I would. Because you see, church, I long for you to know and connect with God. To know the songs we sung this morning. You are his child. You are free. You are loved. You are pursued. I have felt discouraged, but I very quickly learned 
to uh, understand the voice behind the discouragement or the accusation, and I will not let the strategy of the enemy take me down. He will not steal, kill, and destroy. So I've also noticed that he attacks me where I'm most vulnerable. Does he do that to you too? Church family, let's stand against the enemy. I refuse to agree with the enemy of my soul, and I cry out to God saying, thank you, Jesus. You came to give me life and give me life to the full. I need you. I need you now. Renew my mind in your truth. Steady my heart. I choose to receive your love. Increase my faith in you. Expand my territory and my influence for you. Oh, Lord, I need your strength. I want your joy in this journey. The enemy won't take me out, even if he tries to set me back. And the last, I will seek the Lord in solitude. Like Elijah, he ran to that cave. We all need to get alone with God and meet with God to hear his whisper. To hear his whisper. It's okay if you run to meet with him when you're in despair or you're in joy or you're just in complete awe, or you're in celebration, or pain, or gratitude, or anger, I want to challenge you to choose an intentional incline of your heart and your mind toward our God. And you don't have to go to a cave. You could be like me. For my 50th birthday, which was quite a while ago, I received a wonderful gift, a single bright red kayak. I never knew this would change my understanding and my appreciation of meeting God in solitude. I am so relational. My husband was like, she'll never use it. There's no space for two people. She's not going to go by herself. I said, oh, yes, I will. And so it has been a weekly pursuit to get in my red kayak. Why? Because that's where I am still. That's where I listen. That's where I worship. That's where I see. I cry out my prayers, my longings to my powerful, present God. Oh, Lord, protect the vulnerable. Lord, heal the brokenhearted. Make a way, God, for the discouraged. Give me your wisdom. Extend your mercy. Teach me, God. Change me. Help me, Lord. As I meet with God, sometimes the tears flow, sometimes uncontrollably. And sometimes I worship loudly, singing, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my king, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Sometimes the birds, you know, they dance overhead and they sing merrily. And when I start to think that I'm bigger than I am, that I have more power than I do. I look around at my surroundings and I see the mountains on both sides and I say, yes, God, I understand. I am a servant of you. I am small, but I need you, God. I'm reminded of your incredible love. My times of solitude with God bring me refreshment. God pursues, God speaks, God listens, God restores. God directs our journey. In conclusion, in Elijah's discouragement, God meets with him. He whispers to him. He restores him. And he says, okay, Elijah, let's go. I have something for you to do. We're going to enter into a time of communion. So if you wouldn't mind pulling out, if you need some, somebody will bring it for you. I want to give you a moment, a space, to just meet with God privately. Maybe thank him. Thank him for who he is in your journey. And if you don't know Jesus, and you feel you have a broken relationship with God, you can make that right today, right now, right here, by saying, I need you, Jesus. Forgive me for my sins. I invite you to be my Savior and Lord. Come into my life and make me the person you want me to be.
We have a reconciled relationship with our Heavenly Father because of Jesus. How amazing. His death, his life and resurrection. We've been forgiven. We've been granted eternal life. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit to walk a life that is God-honoring and righteous. This is a time of celebration coming to the communion table. Saying, thank you, God. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may now take it. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is my new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Please take a few moments in just quietness to sit in the truth of what Jesus has done for you.